Uh, thanks for the warm welcome. My name is Lane McCandless. I'm just reinventing the wheel up here. Sorry, guys, moving all over the place. I'm excited to be with you guys this morning. Uh, been here a handful of times, and without fail, I always leave just feeling so uplifted. You guys are encouraging and a wonderful body. Before we jump in, can we give thanks to your pastoral staff? I know he's out today, but Vince and Jennifer... <laughs> If you guys are watching this, they, they lead super well. We're so grateful for you guys. And whenever Pastor Vince actually asked me to bring the message today, I was crossing my fingers, hoping that I would get to deliver a lighthearted message to you. But what the Lord put on my heart is not the typical guest pastor message, but I do believe that it's going to be important for us to talk about this morning. So if you're a note taker, if you could just dot, jot down the title of the message, God only loves bad people. God only loves bad people. Well, I'm excited to, to jump into this message. My wife uh, and I live in Branson, Missouri. We have an 11 month old boy. And um, so our world is crazy, upside down. We're learning all sorts of new stuff, but God has been faithful in the midst of it. And the message that I'm speaking today is one that he's put on my heart uh, as well. And it's so convicting for me, but I pray that, that it touches you this morning. In school, I was uh, very gifted at, at something and it was getting in trouble for talking. It really was. I, was. I was amazing at it. I think that my teachers looked at me and said, hey, there's something with this kid. He really has a shot at this. And so they would actually move me to the other side of the room and they would say, Lane, no talking. 30 minutes later, the only thing that they accomplished was I had a new best friend, right? Can anyone relate? They were a talker at school. Well, on the flip side, there was some other things that I was not as gifted at. And one of those subjects happened to be math. Okay. I don't know why, but for whatever reason, math just did not come natural to me. And I think in, in cases such as like history, as long as you knew the basic time period, as long as you knew the basic geographic region, you could kind of fake it till you make it in history class and be just fine. Same thing with literature and language. As long as you knew the basics of sentence structure, we've got a subject, folks. We've got a verb. We've got a preposition. You, again, could fake it till you make it and be just fine. But with math, you were either correct or you were incorrect. And I was more familiar with the latter, right? I was not good at math. And specifically, I remember once I got into trigonometry and calculus, whenever I'd go home, these problems would take 20 to 30 minutes a piece to do. And I would be crossing my fingers, hoping I did it right. The next day, deliver it to the teacher. She wasted a bunch of red ink on my paper to pretty much say wrong, dead wrong. And then the more frustrating part when would, would be when she would look at me and say, Lane, you were so close. If you would have just moved the decimal one place, you would have had it, kiddo. And I remember thinking, oh, can't you kind of give me credit? Like, could we work on something here? Kind of credit for kind of being right. And I actually took that same mentality into my adult life, and maybe you have as well. Think about how we sometimes describe our life or our characteristics to one another. I've caught myself saying these phrases. I'm a good person for the most part. Or I don't lie very often. Or when I do, they're only white lies. Or only a part of me is sinful. And this morning, in all humility, I kind of want to start with a spoiler. I think every single person that walked into this room this morning finds themselves in one of two camps. Camp number one is going to be over here. And camp number one is the person that says, I'm not that bad of a person, Lane. I'm not that bad of a person. For the most part, I've walked the straight and narrow. In comparison to the other people in my life, I'm one of the better ones, right? Uh, the, the sibling, I was probably the best of the siblings. And you think that you've done a lot of good things or that you've done a lot of things that are right. Well, camp number two is the people that walked in this morning thinking I'm too bad of a person for God to love. And there's genuinely people that walked in this morning with that mindset. 
God's love could not possibly reach me. I've made one too many mistakes. I've misstepped time and time and time again. There's no way, there's no way. And the spoiler is this, you both could not be more wrong. Hear me very clearly. I want every single person as we walk out of church today to understand that though you are a sinner, you are never too far gone for the love of Jesus Christ. And this is a weighty message. Like I said, not, not a typical message that a guest pastor would give, but I uh, just wanna pray before we jump into his word to make sure that I communicate this correctly. God, we just come to you right now and we give you the glory and honor and praise that you deserve. God, as this message can sometimes suck the air out of the room and sometimes just cause us to be on our tiptoes, I pray that you'll please just give us a peace that surpasses all understanding. God, regardless of which camp people fall into this morning, I pray that you'll please just make yourself known to them, that it's not about being too good or too bad. God, I pray that you'll please just give me the words to say, empty me of myself and fill me with you. Please just bless this church, bless this congregation and help your name to be lifted high in every situation. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so if you're a note taker, go ahead and jot down the first point today. And the first point is this, good is a standard that you and I can't live up to. Let's just go ahead and get on the same page real quick. Good is a standard that you and I just can't live up to. It's like setting an expectation that we know we'll never hit. But we use this terminology over and over and over again, especially for those of you that might've grown up in Christian homes and Christian environments. So if you have your Bible this morning or the Bible app on your phone, or you wanna look up on the screen, we're gonna be in a few different places, but we're gonna start in the book of Romans today. Romans chapter three. And what Paul does here is he kind of gets us all on the same playing field. This verse is gonna act as a guide for us as the rest of this message. And we're talking about this idea of being good or being bad. Romans three ten through 12 says this, as it is written, there is no one who is righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have all together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Again, Paul, right from the get-go, putting us all on the same page, get off your high horse and pick yourself up. We're all in this together, right? There is no one who does good, not even one. And I don't know about you, but I remember as I would grow up in church and children's church and in Sunday school, I couldn't help myself. I would just naturally compare my life to those in scripture. I would try to figure out who I related to and if I would have done the same things as them. And so as I grow up, I, I remember learning about Adam and Eve and the creation story, just how I'm wired. I would say, Lane, would you have eaten the fruit? Would you have done that? Would you have sinned? And then we get to the story of David and I'm I'm like, all right, I've got five smooth stones. Am I hitting this giant or what? What's gonna happen here? And then I get to Samson and I'm like, what would it be like to be biblically buff, right? Like that sounds pretty cool. I saw Enoch back there earlier today. He looks like he's got that figured out. He's got that going on. Um, and then I would continue in Daniel in the lion's den. Would I, would I have the faith to do what I needed to do there? And then I would get to Jonah. I'm like, would I have taken the waterproof Uber, Uber instead of going to Nineveh? Like, would I have just done these things or would I have not? And I couldn't help myself, but put myself in their shoes. And when push came to shove, I had to come to the honest realization that whenever I would compare my life to those in scripture, I was only comparing my life to the good qualities of other people. Like I never found myself reading scripture being like, oh, I really relate to that bad quality. <laughs> like we just don't do that. So many of us have rose colored glasses on and we're like, yeah, I think I would have done the right thing. I think I would have been a good person. I think I would have been able to check that box. 
And we read stories of David and Goliath and, and we, we, we go, yes, I would have conquered the giant. And we compare ourselves to David when in reality, if you want to compare yourself to anyone in that story, you and I are the terrified Israelites shaking in the corner, cowering in fear in need of a savior, right? We on the same page this morning that a lot of times we make our life look a lot better than it actually is. And maybe that's you this morning that, that has found yourself trapped in comparison. Maybe you found yourself trapped in this idea of behavior modification, which basically means if I do the right things, if I say the right things, then I'm a good person. And that's what infiltrates this thinking about us whenever the thoughts start running through our head and we have thoughts like, well, God only loves me when I do good things. Some people are paralyzed by that thought right here in this room this morning. And then there's some people that are also thinking the opposite. God could not possibly love me because of the things that I've done. And my heart breaks for both of those groups this morning. Why? Because you had the thoughts before you even walked in the church doors this morning. I don't know if I can go sit in that seat. I don't know if I can put on the mask. I don't know if I can fake it till I make it any more. And so as we're starting to kind of talk about this, maybe some questions are coming to the surface. Maybe you're saying, well, Lane, then tell me how good is good enough or how bad is bad enough. And if you're asking those questions, then lovingly, because you're my brothers and sisters, I want to tell you, you're asking the wrong questions. The question you should be asking is how do I faithfully walk in the footsteps of Jesus? Not how good is good enough, how bad is bad enough. How do I edify God in every step that I take? Think about that this morning. Don't rush over that. And it never fails that there has to be a bad guy in every story. I don't know if we have any superhero fans in the room this morning, but can you imagine if Marvel was to say, hey, next week we're rolling out our new movie. We did kind of an interesting thing though. Um, no bad guys this time around, right? That wouldn't go over well. Why? Because Marvel is all about heroes and villains and saving the day. It wouldn't go over well. A bunch of dudes in spandex just looking at each other is not gonna sell movies. But if you haven't read the Bible, here's the quickest way that I know to, to present it to you, okay? Listen very closely, I don't want you to miss this. It's a story of a bunch of bad people and one good guy. And if you read far enough, you realize that the bad people kill the one good guy. And that's the story of the Bible. 66 books, 1,189 chapters, 31,102 verses, all pointing to one name who changed everything. And that's what we're gonna talk about this morning. The fact that I'm even being honest with you guys about saying, hey, I only try to relate to the people that are good in scripture, automatically insinuates that there's other people in scripture that I do not want to be like. And you know about them. There's a handful of people in scripture that whenever you read that story, you go, oh, that's not me. Not taking on those characteristics, not taking on those. But this year, the Lord put someone on my heart and he was like, Lane, you have some of those characteristics. And I hate to break it to you, but it wasn't the good guy in the story. In fact, not even close. It's one of the worst guys you'll ever read about in scripture. I'm gonna give you the Spark Notes version. It's in all the gospel accounts and it's when Jesus has just made his triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem and the crowds are saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And then a week later, what are they crying? Crucify, crucify, crucify. And we roll up on the scene and we see that the Jews have a tradition that on a holy day, one of the prisoners gets to be freed from death row. And so we see Jesus, son of God, the one that's healed the lame, healed the leopard, made the blind see. And then we have Barabbas, a thug, a murderer, a guilty man on death row, one that deserves the chains, one that deserves the crucifixion. 
We don't know a lot about him, but we know that he deserved it. And Pilate, who's playing liaison in this situation, he's washing his hands saying, who do you want? It's a tradition. Who do you want? Do you want Jesus, son of God, or do you want Barabbas, the murderer, thug, and rebel? And they say, give us Barabbas. We want Barabbas. And I can almost picture it as they go up and they unlock the chains and and Barabbas' chains break, but Jesus' heart breaks because now he has to stand silent and trust the will of the Father. So what happens to Barabbas? What happens in those next moments? He walks free. He walks free. And we say, but, but God, he was a bad man. He deserved it. Why, why in the world would that happen? And for years, I've read that scripture and I go, I would have never been the voice in the crowd yelling crucify. Would have never been me. And God in all of his glory prompted me and said, Lane, you're not in the crowd. And you're definitely not Jesus. You're the man up there next to Jesus on death row. And I started studying Barabbas. I became obsessed with him. I wanted to know everything about him because all of a sudden this wasn't the villain and bad guy that I couldn't relate to. This was me up there next to Jesus. Check out what Barabbas's name means. In Aramaic, Bar means son and Abba means father. In other words, Barabbas's name literally is the most generic name anyone could have ever had in all of humanity, a son of a father. Barabbas is a symbolic figure representing all of humanity. And just as Barabbas deserved punishment for his sins and his shame, you and I also deserve punishment for our sins. Boom, snap, just like that in an instant, this story becomes real to you. We look over to see the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one that's never sinned. He's lived a pure, blameless, holy life. Never misstepped, never missed the mark, always got it right. And you look over and you see me and you see you. People that deserve the chains, deserve the consequences, deserved to be on death row. And it's almost as if he looks at you in the most calming manner. He looks at you and he looks at me and says, I know what you've done. I know your best day. I know your worst day. I know the best thing that you'll ever do in your life. And I know the worst thing that you'll ever do in your life. And I love you and I want you to walk in freedom. And that's what your savior is speaking over you this morning, even though some of us are still held in the bondage of those chains. I don't deserve it, God. I don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. And the good news is that our hero is Jesus Christ. We are not the hero of our own story. Our hero is Jesus Christ. And he's not this hero that that hangs it over us. And he's demanding that we worship him. In return, he wants our hearts and to share in his glory. That's what he wants from you and I this morning. Point number two, if you're still taking notes, is this. The gospel is not God making bad people good. The gospel is God bringing people from death to life. From death to life. And I want to make sure that we understand that. I want to make sure that we haven't just got caught up in the emotions. I want to make sure that we understand what it talks about in Ephesians chapter 2. Go ahead and turn there with me. Ephesians chapter 2. This is, a, this is verses 1 through 6, the very start of it. And it says this. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. It goes on to say in later verses, but God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love for us, even when we were dead in our sins and transgressions, made us alive together in Christ by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Do we understand that this morning? That we were dead in our sins in the way that we had lived and the way that we had talked and the way that we had thought and the way that we acted. And growing up in church, being vulnerable, being honest with you, 
the majority of the people and the sad reality of the people in this world is that they believe that they are good. And I see your faces out there like, guest pastor, this is not a very uplifting message, okay? I promise there's hope. I promise there's hope and we're gonna get into it right here. But if you were to ask random strangers, if you guys were all to take notebooks out and go out on the streets of Mountain Home, go cross over anywhere in the United States, anywhere in the world and ask the majority of the people, do you think you're good or do you think they're bad? The majority of the people I think would chalk themselves up higher on the scale. Overall, I'm a good person. Again, because that's what we're used to. I haven't made too many mistakes. I'm a lot better than Joe and I'm a lot better than this person. I'm a lot better. And we just start pointing fingers at other people that we're better at. But most of us, we view, we view Christianity as like Santa's naughty or nice list, hoping you've done a few more good things than bad things this year and that your good outweighs your bad. And I'm guilty of this because I grew up in a culture that talked like this, but a lot of times we use terminology in the church and we say, I'm kind of messed up. I'm kind of broken, bro. I want us to realize that we weren't just messed up. We weren't just broken. We were dead in our sins, eternally separated from a gracious and loving God. But God rich in mercy, made a way for you and I to understand that we can have everlasting life because he sent his one and only son to take your place and to take mine. He is rich in mercy, making a way for you and I this morning. And we've gotten really good at sitting back saying, but but pastor, you just, you don't understand what I'm, what I'm going through. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what my past looks like. Like you probably wouldn't even been talking to me if you knew the half of the things that I've done. But what I want you to do this morning, right where you are, is picture the best person you know. Picture the best person you know. It might be the person sitting next to you. It might be a mentor. It might be someone that's in your family. It might not, but picture the best person you know. One of the best people in my life He's been my mentor for almost nine years. His name is Daniel Chin. He's about a 65 year old man. And I remember sitting down meeting with him for the first time and I said, Daniel, tell me your story. It's my favorite question to ask people. Tell me your story. And he looked at me and he said, do you know whenever Paul writes in scripture that of all the sinners, he's the worst? And I said, yeah. He goes, I feel that. And if you know Daniel Chin, he's the sweetest guy in the world. Like. He wouldn't hurt a fly. He's a biblical and theological studies professor. He's a good dude by all forms and fashions, right? He's a good guy. But what hit me in that moment is I remember thinking he understands the weight of his sin. Like he gets it. He understands that even though he's a good guy, he understands the weight of his sin. More importantly, he understands the power of the cross, And I want you and I this morning to understand the power of the cross and the power of God's redemptive love that he graciously wants to pour out on you and he wants to pour out on me this morning. And I wanna address the elephant in the room before we continue any further. There's some of you saying, but I feel alone in this. Like, like Satan has me right where he wants me. He gets me isolated. He makes me feel like I'm the only person struggling with this. But the good news is that you are not alone. You also aren't supposed to live into the fact that you are a bad person. And the reason I know this is because Romans 3.23, again, puts us all on the same page. And Romans 3.23 says this, for not some, for all. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You're not alone. I don't care what the lie is that the enemy is speaking over you this morning. Not some, not an occasional person, all. All have sinned. Not measurements, not scales. All of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. But God being rich in his mercy, again, he does not leave us there. In 1 John, we learn that if we confess that sin, he is faithful, he is just to cleanse us of our sin and forgive us of all unrighteousness. 
That's not something that's far off. That's something that's very real and right now available to you and I this morning. And because I love you, I wanna be as transparent as I can and share the two lies that the enemy hits me with more than any other lie. And it's this, the first thing is, he says, Lane, you've got it all figured out. You've got it all figured out. And I can pinpoint these times in my life when I start to believe this lie. It's when I get very arrogant. It's whenever I start, start ixing people out of my life saying, I don't need you anymore. It's whenever I start to say, I have a handle on this, God. My plan sounds a lot better than yours. And then almost in a complete 180, the other lie that the enemy hits me with is, Lane, you're an absolute wreck. You're a disaster. You'll never amount to anything. How could anyone possibly love you? And I have a feeling that I'm not alone. I have a feeling as I'm talking about some of those lies, some of you are going, yeah, that's the same thing I struggle with. And if you're like me and you constantly teeter between absolute pride and absolute guilt, there is hope. And what's helped me is reflecting on a person in scripture that's kind of done some of the same things that I've done, not in a comparison way, but in a way that goes, oh my goodness, I'm not alone in the midst of this. And for years, I read this book and I read it through the lens of the people that were in this book were great, amazing people that never made a mistake and never messed up. Of course, God would use Ruth. Of course, he would use Esther. Of course, he would use David. Why wouldn't he? They're amazing. They're just like you and me. And there's one guy in particular, his name's Peter, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Peter. But Peter's story is a great reminder for us of God's faithfulness and his patience. In his worst moment, he's cutting off a dude's ear and denying Jesus three times. In his best moment, he's completely changing history of the early church and leading them very, very well. And when we read about Peter's life, we can breathe this sigh of relief going, okay, I'm not alone. Because even though Peter blew it, even though Peter completely messed up, even though Peter completely denied knowing Jesus, he cared enough to get it right. He cared enough to look to the only one that matters. And Peter finally understood that it wasn't about the good moments in his life. And it also wasn't about the bad moments in his life. It was all about the man on the middle cross who died a criminal's death so that he could find eternal life even in the midst of his sins. Do we understand that this morning? Do we fully wrap our heads around the fact that, that it's not the best things that we do in our life that define us? It's also not our mistakes that define us. It's not your absolute best day mountaintop moment and it's for sure not your valley. I can't believe I did that moment. What he wants us to understand is the only thing that defines us is the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. Point number three this morning is this. If perfection is the standard for salvation, then you and I are hopelessly lost. If perfection is the standard for salvation, then we're hopelessly lost. And there's this wonderful story in scripture. It's in the gospel accounts where this guy is known as the rich young ruler and he encounters Jesus and he asks the question that I think you and I would ask if we were in his scenario as well. He gets the opportunity to finally meet this man that's been talked about, that's open blind eyes and deaf ears healed the lame, the leopard. And he says, he says, okay, I've got this question. What is it that I must do to inherit eternal life? It's a good question to ask, right? He's asking the right questions. And we think we know how Jesus is going to answer. But instead, if you go back and read it, Jesus answers by giving him five of the 10 commandments. And it's almost as if he can't wait for Jesus to finish talking before he pipes up and says, oh, I've done all those. I've done him since I was a kid. Like this man's self-confidence is off the charts. He's talking to Jesus, the one that's never made a mistake. And he's claiming that he's also never made a mistake. 
And I wrestled with that and I was like, why in the world would Jesus answer in that way? But get this, Jesus responds with five of the 10 commandments because what Jesus is trying to do here is answer in the same manner that the rich young ruler was asking his question. The rich young ruler was looking for an action instead of looking for a savior. Point blank simple. He was looking for what must I do instead of who are you? That's the story of the rich young ruler. And if you and I are being honest this morning, some of us are also trusting in behavior modification a lot more than we're trusting our savior. We play the part, we walk in on Sundays, we do the right things, we say the right things, we smile, we shake hands, put on a mask. And at the end of the day, even though we say it's all about God, we trust behavior modification, doing the right things at the right time, saying the right things a lot more than trusting the savior. And I'm not saying that to pour out guilt on you, to pour out shame on you, first of all, because I'm also guilty of it, but rather the opposite. For the person that's in this room this morning that maybe you've been carrying around the idea of, I just can't get it right. I, I, I just can't help it. I slip up time and time again. My prayer for you this morning is that weight would fall off of your shoulders and you can lay it and leave it at the feet of Jesus before walking out of those doors this morning. What Jesus is doing to the rich young ruler is he's looking at him and he's saying, hey buddy, if you're wanting to save yourself, go for it. But it requires absolute perfection, never missed the mark, never made a mistake, never stumbled. And here's where you and I start reading this story going, wow, if the standard's perfection, then I'm not gonna make it. But the good news for you and I is that Jesus had a redemption plan from the beginning. He took your guilt, he took your shame, he took your place, he took your consequence. He never expected you to be perfect. And unfortunately, Jesus ends up looking at that rich young ruler and he says, buddy, all I want is your heart. That's all I want. All I want is your heart. Just, just give up your things and follow me. And we see the rich young ruler drop his head and walk away. Walks away from the best gift that would have ever been given to him. And we see that a few times in scripture. We also see whenever Jesus encounters a Samaritan woman who had been doing a lot of things wrong over and over and over again. And whenever Jesus has an encounter with her, what does she do? She runs back into the village and says, I met a guy that told me everything I've ever done. She doesn't clean up her life. She doesn't say, oh, I need to live a certain way before I go tell others about it. She practices evangelism saying, I'm not, I'm not gonna pretend I've gotten it right. In fact, I've, I've messed up so many times, but I met the man who changed everything for me. So if you were in camp number one at the beginning of this service, hear me very clearly. God does not want your, I'll pull myself up by my bootstraps. I'm gonna fix it on my own. I deserve the guilt. I deserve the shame. I'm worthless. He also doesn't want your, I'm a good person. I've walked the straight and narrow. I don't really need this message, Lane. He genuinely and simply wants your heart. Regardless of which camp you fell into at the beginning of the service, he genuinely wants your heart. And the fourth point this morning is this. It's better to be forgiven than good. It's better to be forgiven than good. Luke 19, 10 is a familiar verse in scripture. And it says, for the son of man came to seek and to save those who were lost. It's a good verse. It comes off the tail end of a story about Zacchaeus. We know that Zacchaeus was a, you guys have heard the song, you know it. Get used to me asking you to sing by this point. We know that he was a wee little man, but we also know that he was hated. We know that he was a tax collector. We know that he was guilty. We know that he was more importantly lost and in desperate need of a savior. In Luke 19, five through 10, we read the story of Zacchaeus and I haven't been able to shake it lately. It's phenomenal. It says, when Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and he said, Zacchaeus, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your house today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus in with great excitement and great joy. 
but people were displeased. They were saying he has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half of my wealth to the poor, Lord. If I have cheated them on their taxes, I will pay them back four times as much. And Jesus responded, salvation has come to this man's home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save those who are lost. What I love about this story is that between verse seven and verse eight, He goes from a notorious sinner to someone who experienced a savior. And so many of us are like, can we put a 7.5 in there? Can we put a verse 7.5, please? Like maybe he needed to do some good things real quick. Maybe he needed to clean up his act. Maybe he needed to do a lot of good things. No, no, no. Between verse seven and verse eight, notorious sinner experiencing a savior that changed everything. And if you catch how that passage ended, it says this, salvation has come to this home today. Salvation being personified here is incredibly important. It's of the utmost importance. Why? Because if you grew up in a home where you had to think that salvation maybe came through praying a prayer or through sacraments or or through works or by doing good things or, or that it was a process, What scripture shows us here, plain and simple, is that salvation came to Zacchaeus' house because salvation was a person. Salvation is Jesus. So yes, I'm gonna stick with the title of the message today. God only loves bad people. And I can't say it better myself, so I'm gonna quote David Marvin here. He says, good people can't go to heaven because good people don't exist. Heaven's not gonna be full of good people. It'll be full of forgiven people. And that's good news for you and I this morning. And I don't know about you, but I'm so looking forward to that day. Whenever I'm in heaven and I round the corner and I'm like, no way, you're here? That's crazy. And that guy's rounding the corner at the same time going, Lane, no way you're here. Why? It wasn't anything that I did. It wasn't anything that he did. It wasn't anything that you could possibly do. It was all because of God. And that's available to you. That's available to me right here, right now. And my prayer for this church is that you guys would leave these doors and you would live in such a way, whether it was at the supermarket or the coffee shop, that whenever people run into you, they go, wow, there's something different about those real life church people. And you get the privilege and honor of looking at them and saying, there is. Can I buy you a cup of coffee and tell you about the man that changed everything for me? Oh, they're, they're, they're a good person. There's just something different about those real life people. They're good. And you get to look at them and say, the only good in me is all because of God. <laughs>